Well, all right, Romans chapter 10, let's open the word of prayer and let's dig into the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We love you, Lord. You are indeed a great and an awesome God. And Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. Give us ears to hear. Give us willing hearts to receive what you have for us. Lord, make, make us attentive to your word. We ask these things in your holy and your precious name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. By way of quick review, real quick, again, Romans, book of doctrine. Pastors were asked if they teach any one book, had to teach only one book of the Bible for the rest of their lives. Over 70% said Romans. Why? Because it has so much biblical truth or doctrine. First, we saw the doctrine of sin in chapters 1 to 3, that we're all sinners in need of a Savior. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Then we saw in the second part, second part of doctrine, it went from the doctrine of sin to the doctrine of salvation. Sin's the problem. Jesus is the answer. Amen. And so we saw doctrine of sin, doctrine of salvation, and then the doctrine of sanctification. That's being molded into the image of our Savior. Uh, salvation is Christ dying for us. Sanctification is Christ living in us. So now we've come to the doctrine of sovereignty, and then we will finish up with the doctrine of service, all this in the book of Romans. Now, sovereignty means, it's quite simply, that God is in control, and aren't you glad? Amen? Amen? So God is in control, God is sovereign, God knows all things, God can't learn anything because he's God, amen? He doesn't change his mind, he knows. He knew that Jesus was, you know, the Bible says that Jesus was a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He knows who's gonna accept him and who's gonna reject him before we're even born. Do we know that? So God is sovereign, God is all-knowing, all-powerful. He elects, he chooses, he adopts, right? And he knows who is going to be adopted. He knows who's coming into the kingdom of God long before it happens. So we have the sovereignty of God, but as we're gonna see this morning, there's also the free will of man. And what happens a lot in the church today, people will run to one side or the other assuming they both can't be true because we're thinking with finite minds trying to understand infinite God. So some people believe, well, it's got to be all my free will and all my works and it's all about me and it's what I do that saves me. And then there's others that say, well, it's all God in the sense that he does it and then he forces salvation on some and restricts salvation from others because if he's sovereign and knows who's going to be saved, then he must have chosen them and, and not chosen others. And, and so there's this this diatribe that either you believe in the sovereignty of God or you believe in the free will of man. And when people say, do you believe in the sovereignty of God or the free will of man? I say, yes, I believe in both. And you know why I do? Because the Bible teaches both, amen? That God is sovereign, God knows everything, and yes, we have free will. So it gives people a headache. Well, how can God have chosen you before the foundation of the world and then you still have free will? Because of course, God knows, God knows knew before the foundation. He knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin in the garden, didn't he? And he knew that Jesus was going to have to come, didn't he? And we're going to see this morning as we continue looking at God's plan for his chosen people, Israel. They were chosen by God. They were uh, his chosen people before the foundation of the world. He gave them the word of God. He gave them more exposure to the truth than any people who have ever lived. And yet, even though they were chosen by God, they chose largely to rebel against him. So God chose them, and then they chose to reject him, proving that just because God chooses some that they don't have to respond, he's not gonna force them to respond. And even though he chose Israel, he chose them knowing they were going to fail him. Gives everybody a headache in the room. Can we all say amen? I don't get it. I don't, and here's the reality. We're not going to fully get it until we get to heaven. Can we say amen to that? All I know is this. I know that God is sovereign. God loves me. And I know that God drew me by his Holy Spirit. But I also know that I can accept him or reject him. And I want to encourage all of us to take care of our end of it. The Lord's already taken care of his. Can we say amen to that? He continues to take care of his, and now it's up to us to respond to him. So, if you got your outline, grab it. They're on the back table, if you didn't get one. Uh, but we're gonna talk this morning as we continue to look at uh, this letter to the Roman church, a church that Paul had never been to at this point. And we looked at the sovereignty of God last week, and now this week, we're gonna look at human responsibility. Guys, the sovereignty of God does not remove your responsibility. Can we say amen to that? Amen. People will say, well, if God's sovereign and God wants to do it, 
I have a family member that every time he talks to me, he's like, it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter what you decide to do, you don't have to respond to your calling, you don't have to do anything. God's sovereign, he's gonna do it with you or without you. Does God need me? No. Do I need him? What's the answer? And does God desire to use us for his glory? What's the answer? So the sovereignty of God does not remove the responsibility of man. So looking at the outline, I tell the message, human responsibility. He's talking specifically to Israel, but there's applications for us as well. Man's attempt to do things his own way. We're going to see Israel in their ignorance seeking to establish their own righteousness. We're going to establish our own way to get to heaven, and we're going to figure out that way. And so the law showed them they were sinners in need of a Savior, and instead of recognizing the Messiah when he came, instead, what did they do? They chose to use the law as the source of salvation as opposed to the mirror that shows them they need a savior. Guys, if we look at the law and we think we're going to get saved because we're going to completely obey this, just remember, the standard you use for salvation is the standard you're going to be held to. How many of you guys want to be held to keeping the word of God perfectly from the day you were born? Uh, game over. Amen? The standard is Jesus Christ him crucified and risen from the dead. And aren't you glad? And receiving the free gift by grace. Guys, as free moral agents, we, have, we respond to God's calling by faith and brokenness and repentance, or we seek to establish our own path to God. Second, we're going to see the contrast between true righteousness and man's attempt at righteousness. Again, often we think the person that lives the most strict life is the most holy person. And the reality is, the Bible talks about the fact that those who are the most legalistic are actually the weaker brethren, the ones who are trying to earn heaven by the law. We know the Pharisees in the time of Jesus, they walked around in the black robes and they loved the praise of men and they would tithe their, you know, their spices, 10% of my come and go into the Lord, 10%. I mean, they, were, they held the law with a tight fist and missed the Messiah. Guys, it's not good enough to try to be good on your own. The reality is that the law is a taskmaster that leads us to the cross. Thirdly, we're going to see salvation is God's righteousness imputed to all who respond to his grace. And people who disagree with me, that's okay. I believe salvation is offered universally, accepted individually. I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be offered universally this morning. And then you have an opportunity to accept or reject the free gift of salvation that is being offered by our Savior. We're going to see the source of truth faith is God's word. You know, when I planted the church in Santa Cruz, and then I brought it with me here, that when I was praying about planting that first church, I thought, Lord, what is the theme verse of the church? That's the whole Bible, but Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by... Word to God. What's our radio program called? Faith comes by hearing. Why? Because it's the word of God that transforms us. It's not us being religious. It's not us trying to do good works. It's, it's the word of God that transforms us. Amen? And then th finally, we're going to see God's sovereign foreknowledge of Israel's response. So God's going to know, even though he chose them, even though they heard the word, God's not done with them, by the way, and we're thankful for that, but God chose them, he exposed them to the truth, he reached out to them in grace all day long, and yet they chose to reject him. My prayer is, you don't go to church your whole life and never surrender your life to the Lord. Religion will not save you. You must have a relationship with Jesus. Can we say amen? All right, so let's begin there in Romans chapter 10, looking at verse one, man's attempt to do things his own way. It says there, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they all may be saved. We saw this last week that Paul said he would be willing to be accursed for the sake of his people. If you remember, Paul was Saul of Tarsus, and he was the Jew of all Jews. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a very religious man. He was a a one who kept all of the laws. He was zealous as they come for Judaism. But he too had missed the Messiah. And he was on the road to Damascus to go and attack more Christians, to go enslave more Christians. He was going out with notes in his hand and fire in his belly and a passion to go and bring persecution to those who would follow the way, follow Jesus. And on that road, he got knocked off his high horse. And he had a head-on collision with Jesus Christ. 
And then he surrendered his life to the Lord. So here he is. He understands these people that are caught up in the religious law because he was the king of them, if you will. He was one of the chief people that followed that pattern. And now his heart is broken for the very same people that he once was and the very same people who have one motivation at this point when it comes to Paul, which is to see him dead. Remember, how the Jews responded to Paul so far? Stoned to death at Lystra, scourged, beaten, enslaved, falsely accused, falsely imprisoned. There was even a group that took a vow not to eat again until Paul was dead. And Paul could have certainly been bitter. And he could have looked, said, you bunch of religious so-and-sos, you know, I can't wait, hell's going to be hot for you, man. You hear some Christians talk that way? I put quotes by the name Christian there. Guys, we should not delight that people have hard hearts toward God. And we should not delight in the fact that even those with hard hearts may spend eternity in hell. Our hearts should be broken for them, we should be praying for them, and we should love them supernaturally. Can we say amen to that? And Paul's an example, because here's what he's saying. Hey, I desire that all of Israel would be saved. I want to see all my brethren come to Christ. I have a burden for them. I want them to know the truth. I've come to know the truth. And guys, religion didn't save me, and keeping the law didn't save me. And I walked around with a burden, and I was zealous, but I was wrong. And my burden, is they would all come to know the love of God. Paul feels compelled to reiterate his love and burden for the Jewish people. They're his brethren. They want Paul dead. He wants them saved. Think about that. They want him dead. He wants them saved. So when you meet people that aren't that kind to you, that talk bad about your faith or persecute it, uh, somebody here in the church was saying that one of the Sundays we were all, some people were walking by and there were some people up the front door, gate, uh, uh, desk and they said, oh, there's those church people. Somebody works out. There's those church people. They came and told me. I go, okay. Praise the Lord. Amen. At least they know there's church people here. People worshiping Jesus here. We need to pray for them. Amen? It doesn't bother me one bit. It really does. Aren't you bothered by that? No. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you. Amen? And that's not even persecution. But you know what? He had been beaten, stoned. Again, they sought to tear him to pieces. They vowed not to eat or drink until he was dead, and he still loved them. His love and his heart's desire produced a concrete action. Look what it says in the second part of that verse. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. It's a one thing to desire to see someone's life change. It's another thing to do something about it. And one of the things we can all do is pray. Can we say amen to that? I kind of encouraged, exhorted you last week to write down five names and pray for them every day this week. I hope you did that. If you haven't started doing that, I want to encourage you to do it now. Pray for opportunities. Pray for people that don't know the Lord. Pray for for coworkers, pray for neighbors, pray for family members, pray for fellow students if you're in school. Pray that their eyes will be open to the truth of the gospel and pray for an opportunity to share your faith with them. Paul, though they wanted to kill him, was on his knees praying for them. We can fall into the trap of not having a love for people because they don't have a love for us. Guys, we shouldn't be surprised when people who don't know God act like they don't know God. Amen? We shouldn't be surprised. We're different. We're born again. We're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they're lost. How often do you truly intercede on behalf of others, especially those who mistreat you? The word desire there, where he says, I desire, in the Greek means to purpose. He said, my heart's purpose is that they might be saved. My heart's passion is that they might be saved. The goal of my life is seeing people saved. Guys, is that the number one thing on our heart, to know God and to make him known? Because that's what it should be. Because when the Lord saved us, he saved us to know him and to make him known. And if we're keeping it to ourselves, that's the most selfish thing that we can do. It says that they might be saved. Israel considered the Gentiles in need of salvation, but saw no need for their own salvation. And what made Israel feel that they had no need for salvation is their birthright. We're God's chosen people. So we don't need anything. 
We're, God chose us. We're special. We're unique. Well, God did choose them. They are special. They are unique. God's not done with them yet. I'm pro-Israel because God's pro-Israel. Now, that being said, he chose them, but could they still spend eternity in hell separated from God? What's the answer? Yes. Because, guys, the Lord has a heart for them. He revealed truth to them. And we can fall into the same trap today. Well, I've gone to church my whole life. I live in America. I live in a Christian nation. I've got Christian parents. So I'm one of God's chosen people. I'm one of God's people. You know, my family, I've got missionaries in my background. I've got pastors in my background. When people meet me and find out I'm a pastor, they always tell me about the most godly relative they have. Always. Oh, you're a pastor. My great uncle was a missionary (laughs) for 74 years. Great for him. What about you? Amen? Did he live long enough to to, to make you his mission field? Amen? And we want to point to heritage. Guys, it's got nothing to do with heritage. It's got everything to do with right standing before God through Jesus Christ. Amen? So here's his desire. Here's his passion. And he says here in verse 2, For I bear them witness that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. I think I can think of few things that are more dangerous than zeal without knowledge. Being zealous for a lie. Zeal, I, you hear people all the time, well, as long as you believe, and as long as you're passionate about it, and as long as you're fully invested in it, you're going to work out okay. That is the dumbest thing anyone could ever say. I'm zealous that two plus two is five. It's five. I'm making up t-shirts. Two plus two is five. We're going to have rallies. Two plus, it's four. <laughs> Amen? The people that flew into the Twin Towers, were they zealous? They thought they were going to have 70 virgins and palaces on the other side. Not so much. They were zealous without knowledge. Amen? They were zealous for a lie. Just because someone's passionate doesn't mean it's true. Amen? Now, that being said, we ought to be more zealous for the truth than they are for a lie. Can we say amen to that? And yet we see that people will do for a lie more than Christians will often do for the truth. People will come knock on your door for the lie. Amen? People will sit with a booth out in front of Kmart for a lie. People will go on missions trips on bicycles and leave their families for two years for a lie. And then we'll sit at home and share our faith with nobody when we have the truth. Lord forbid. Amen? We need to be shaken out of our comfort zones for the kingdom of God. Zealous, passionate, fervent, but no knowledge of the true and living God. I th- here's how I equate it. They're running full speed in the dark. That's what I think about zealous for a lot. Just running full speed, have no idea where they're going, what they're going to run into. And guys, we have the truth. And the most selfish thing we can do is go to heaven by ourselves. Amen? So they were zealous. You know, what's funny is verse 2 is a perfect description of Paul before he got saved. Amen? He was running in the dark. He was zealous. But he was zealous for a lie, for the rejection of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. You know what? The Muslims are zealous. They're zealous for a lie. Amen? Muhammad is a false prophet. He was a prophet of the sword. He was a molester of children. The way they got their first followers, they would come and put a sword to your throat and say, confess that Muhammad is a prophet and Allah is God or we're going to cut your throat. Get a lot of converts that way. So Muhammad was basically saying, follow me or I'll kill you. Jesus says, follow me because I died for you. That's a little different message. Can we say amen to that? And so the false prophets, zeal doesn't mean that you're right. Guys, if we, we should be zealous, but not zealous for a lie. Saul was a notorious, uh, Saul of Tarsus was a notorious persecutor of Christians before Jesus knocked him off his high horse and he became zealous 
for the truth. Again, you can be compassionate. Can you even be sincere for a lie? I think so. What I mean by that is that you really believe it's true. And you really believe what you're doing is right. And you're, you're blind to the truth. And so when you do it, you're not, you know, I'm going to drag as many people to hell with me as possible. I don't think that's what they're thinking. They're coming to the door thinking they have the answer. And guys, that's a divine appointment, but not a divine appointment for them to convert us, but for us to convert them. So look for those opportunities. And here's Paul saying they're zealous, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant, verse 3, of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. They're ignorant of God's righteousness. There's one way God said to get to heaven and Jesus is the only way. Amen? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So when you take Jesus out of the equation, I don't care how religious you are, I don't care how zealous you are, I don't care, compare, care how passionate you are, you're wrong. And here they are, they're ignorant to the righteousness of God, they've rejected the Messiah. That in, is there a few prophecies about the coming Messiah in the Old Testament? If you've been coming on Thursday night, Jesus is in every chapter. Every chapter of the Old Testament, all of it, pointing to the Lord. Every sacrifice, pointing to the Lord. Every feast, pointing to the Lord. Every piece of furniture in the tabernacle and later the temple, pointing to Jesus Christ. All of it, pointing to the Lord. The law, pointing to Jesus. All of it, pointing to Jesus. And sadly, they had thousands of years of having the truth having the law, having the prophets, having the word of God, having the word, uh, you know, God spoke to them from Mount Sinai, the presence of God upon the ark, the Holy Spirit being in their presence, and yet they rejected it. And guys, I think that the saddest truth is those who've had the greatest exposure to the truth, sadly many of them never respond by faith. So they decided to figure out their own way to get to heaven. If you talk, look, the city we live in, the city this church is in, is about 70% Jewish. We love the Jewish people. We want to see them saved. Can we say amen to that? There are many Jewish people that are saved. Thank you, Jesus, for that. There's great messianic uh, churches. Praise God for that. And you know what? I would love to see more Jewish believers in this church. How about you? Now, that being said, they're still in the same trap, those who rejected Jesus as the Messiah, because now they don't even have the sacrificial system anymore. So I'll ask Jewish people when I meet them, I love to meet them, when I meet them, I know their divine appointments. I got in a car accident a while back. I met the guy, he found, saw my Christian stickers, he told me, we sat there for two and a half hours talking about the Lord. I know that's why that guy hit my car, because there was a divine appointment waiting. But when we were talking, I asked him, so what do you guys, how about the sacrificial system? You guys aren't making sacrifices anymore. What's up with that? Well, now we just believe in keeping the law. Okay, so no more shedding of blood for the remission of sins. No more everything that was in the Old Testament, we don't need that anymore. Guys, that all points to Jesus. Well, keeping the law, how are you doing with that? Oh, it's difficult. Over 600 laws. Not difficult, it's impossible. Amen? And so, when you try to earn your own righteousness through your own good works, you're going to find out that you fail every time. And this is Paul's heart, is that they're zealous, they're religious, but they're lost. And my heart is that they would all be saved. Guys, that ought to be our heart too. Can we say amen to that? So we have a choice to respond to the good news. Now, of course, many of the Jews in the first century did respond because this is a Jewish book written about a Jewish Savior, written by Jewish people. Amen? So praise God for the early church. Praise God for Israel. We wouldn't, meet, we wouldn't have our relationship with God without Israel. Praise God for Israel. But that being said, many of them saw the truth and chose to reject it. Again, broad is the path that leads to destruction. You can be religious, but have no relationship with God. It's still true today. If you go to Israel, they'll be dressed in black. They're wearing their phylacteries around their head and on their arms, and you know, they've got the prayer shawls on, and they're over at the wailing wall doing their prayers. You know, I've flown to Israel and El Al, and they'll get up, and when it's prayer time, they'll get up on the plane and get enough guys together where they can pray, and they're very zealous. And the good news is, 
God's not done with them, and many of them are still going to get saved, and largely that will happen, in my opinion, during the Great Tribulation. We're going to see revival amongst Israel. We'll see later on in this text. But guys, we can be very religious, we can keep all the stuff, and we can still be very lost. Jesus said again, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. People say that's too narrow or that's too easy. I've used this analogy 20 times, 21 won't hurt you. The building's on fire, and the fire chief comes in and says, that's the way out. I'm running out. Well, that's just narrow. That's just one way out. I don't know that I like that way. What if I want to tunnel under? What if I want to chisel through the wall? That's the way out. Fire, get out. Salvation, Jesus. He is the door. He is the way. Amen? But the world will say, but yeah, I don't like that, and I want to go my own way. Well, that's what the children, that's what the children of Israel were doing at this point. It's too narrow to say that Jesus is the only way, the world would say. God loves everybody. Surely he'll save them all. I had a coworker who came up to me at a sales training, and there was, I don't know, 500 people there. She came up and said, I hear you're a pastor. And she goes, what kind of church do you pastor? And I said, uh, non-denominational Christian church. She goes, what's it called? I said, Calvary Chapel. Oh, I don't like Calvary Chapel. <laughs> okay. I live in Orange County. There's Calvary Chapels everywhere. I don't like those Calvary Chapel people. I go, why is that? She goes, they have a problem with my church. Okay. And we teach the Bible at our church too. I said, praise God. So she started telling me about her church. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. What do you have to do to go to heaven? Let's just cut to the chase. Amen. How are you getting to heaven? Oh, I just believe that all people will get there. Okay, now you and I study a different Bible then. Amen? Because Jesus said, he's, oh, I just believe a good Muslim or a good Buddhist. You know what? I would believe that too, but there are no good Muslims. There's no good Buddhists. There's no good Christians apart from Christ. None righteous. So here's the point of this. Man's attempt to get to God his own way will fail every single time. Jesus is God. He created everything. He suffered and died that you might have eternal life, and only through him can you be saved. And because he's God, he makes the rules. Amen? And if we think we're smarter than God, proclaiming to be wise, we have become as fools. Amen? So, zealous for God, Sin left undealt with, no more sacrifice for sins anymore. Again, trusting in their good works. The law and good works cannot save anyone. It requires a sacrifice. Point number two, the contrast between true righteousness and man's attempt at righteousness. Look at verse four. It says, therefore, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who what? Believes. Everything about the Jewish religion pointed to the coming Messiah. Again, the sacrifices, the priesthood, the temple, the feast, the covenants. And the law told them they were sinners in need of a Savior. But instead of le letting the law bring them to Christ, they worshiped the law and rejected the Savior. Jesus Christ is the end of the law, the text says. Now, it doesn't mean that the law is gone. He didn't do away with it. He fulfilled it. So the law was all pointing to our need for a savior, it was a standard, it was a mirror. The Bible says that the law is a taskmaster or a schoolmaster that leads us to the cross. Is that in 1 Corinthians? You know, and so when you look at the law and you put it up against yourself, you realize, I don't measure up. Can we say amen to that? How many, how many people we got that sinned this week? Raise your hand. I got both hands up. <laughs> Thoughts, anger, bitterness, whatever, faithlessness sin. But you know what? I'm so glad that I'm not trying to earn heaven because I would never be good enough. How about you? Christ is the fulfillment of the law and all it pointed to. He didn't do away with it. It still reflects God's standard showing us that we cannot do it on our own, that we need the Lord. He says there true righteousness in that verse. True righteousness in everyone. So what is true righteousness? Law can't make me righteous. The only, only one thing can, and that's my belief or my faith in Jesus Christ. God imparts, faith, God imparts belief and faith. And guys, as we respond by faith, then and only then are we saved. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
True righteousness is imparted to everyone who believes. Now, there's, I don't have time to go through all this, but there are people that say, well, then you're regenerated first, and then that gives you the power to believe, so he had to regenerate you before you could respond. I don't see that in the Bible. Here's what I see. He desires that none should perish, no, not one. He, by his spirit, draws people unto himself, and you can accept him or reject him. There is the free will of man, and yes, there is the sovereignty of God. Does he know who will respond? The answer is yes. Does he force you to respond? The answer is no. We're not robots. Amen. We choose to accept or reject Jesus Christ. Look at verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. The path of righteousness through the law is plain. If you want to find life through the law, you must keep the law and do it perfectly and never fail it once. If you want the law to be your standard, you will be judged by it. I'm glad I won't stand before God on judgment day and be judged by the law because I'm guilty a million times over. Amen? But instead, I stand before him, not in my good works, not under the law, but under the grace of God. And the Father sees us through the shed blood of his Son, and he sees us holy and perfect and righteous. We don't make ourselves righteous. Jesus Christ's death on the cross made us righteous if we put our faith in him. Can we say amen to that? I don't want the law to be... No. Is the law still a good standard for a way for us to, tr to live? What's the answer? Yes. Thou shalt not kill. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Amen? Those schools and courthouses keep taking it down. That's inflicting your religious beliefs. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not, you know, honor your father and mother. These are all good things that are taught throughout the word of God. But guys, keeping the law won't save us because we can't keep it. There was one who came who kept it. Who was that? Proving himself to be God by doing what no one else could do. Verse 6 and 7. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Righteousness of faith based on Jesus. We don't have to work to get to Jesus. What I mean by that is we don't bring Jesus down and we don't drag Jesus up. The Lord doesn't need our help. We need his. Amen? And we don't ascend to heaven. He came to earth. Amen? We don't reach up and pull him down. He came down to earth freely, became one among us, and suffered and died in our place that we might have eternal life. We don't have to ascend into heaven to find him, and he came to earth, as he came to earth to die, and said, it is finished. We don't have to bring him down. He came down freely. We don't have to bring Christ up. He's already risen from the dead. He's triumphed over sin and death. Christ descended from heaven, ascended from the grave without my help or yours. And because of that, you and I can be forgiven and go to heaven. Sadly, man seeks to complicate the simple truth to establish salvation by works. Here's what every cult does. They make the Lord less and man more. Every one of them. Name one, I'll, I'll show you how it's true. The Mormon church believes that the God of our planet used to be a man on another planet who was so good, he got to be God of our planet. And they will, see if you didn't know that, knocking on your door, oh, these seem so nice. They got Jesus in the name of their church. They must be, no, they think they're gonna be God of their own planet. And they're gonna populate the planet with all their multiple wives. That's why they believe in polygamy. You know what that's doing? Making God less and man more. God was a man and I'm going to be God. No and no. Amen. Amen? But this is what happens when we're trusting in our own good works and in our own strength and we think we're making ourselves righteous by things that we do. Our flesh wants to complicate so we can boast in our good works and sacrifices and suffering. By the way, do yourself, I don't think we need to walk around and tell how amazingly we're doing for the Lord. You know, look at all the things I'm doing for God. You're just blessed to be in my presence. Let me just tell you, I, they call me saddle knees. I pray 17 hours a day. 
Just want you to know that. Camel knees, I just, you know, I'm just praising. You know, and I, I, I just want you to know I prayed. I interceded for you 11 hours last night. I just want you to know that. And then I just want you to know that I shared, I shared my faith with 5,000 people last week. And I do that, you know, and people will tell you all they're doing. You know what? If you're truly humbly serving the Lord, you don't need to tell anybody. Amen? You're doing it for the Lord, not for the world. And those who are on their knees praying for you, they're not going to have to broadcast it so somehow you think more of them. Guys, what we do, we ought to do for the Lord, not the praise of men. Amen? Verse 8. But what does it say? The word of God is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Here's what I want you to know. Salvation is not far away. Amen? Amen. Salvation isn't, oh, tell me your testimony. Oh, you're a horrible person. Oh, how many things did you do wrong? Oh, you know what? It's going to take you about 17 years of intense study and self-deprecation to be worthy to be saved. And I've actually met, there was a church behind our church in San Jose where I was youth pastor, and it was a church of Christ. Maybe if you're from that background, God bless, maybe you're not all the, like, but they taught that if unless you're baptized in our baptismal, after going through our discipleship class, after being confirmed that you're worthy to be baptized, then and only then can you be saved. And I met a guy, because our parking lot shared, and I was out studying in my car, and we started talking, and he said he was afraid to leave his house, and he had taken three weeks off of work because he was afraid he was going to get killed on his motorcycle while he was waiting to be baptized, and he'd go to hell. I was like, dude, men don't decide whether you're worthy to be saved. Jesus already said you're worthy when he hung on the cross. Amen? Amen? And he desires that none should perish, no, not one. And guys, we, we, we almost feel like, well, I've done so many bad things, I'm going to have to crawl on glass to Mecca to prove that I'm really worthy of being saved. Guys, we don't earn it. If we earned it, it would be a paycheck. It's not a paycheck, it's a free gift. Amen? It's by grace we've been saved, not of works lest any man should boast. And he's letting them know salvation is near you. It's not 47 classes away. It's not all these things you have to do to be worthy before the Lord. I mean, Jesus, I love so many examples. The thief on the cross, did he get saved? What's the answer? How many classes did he go to? How many times did he go to church? How many times has he been in chapel? How many people did he share his faith with? What had he done? He just re- told the other, dude, he, we've done nothing wrong. This, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Today you'll be with me in paradise. That's not far away. Amen? He's near you. Salvation is available. The Lord's not hiding. We don't have to go on a journey or some long trek to find the Lord. You can take a thousand steps away. It's one step back. He desires intimate fellowship with you. The word of God is near you. It's in your mouth. Doesn't require a journey, a trek, or many steps. It's within your reach. It's easy to, be, to understand, to be remembered. True righteousness requires no good works on our part, simply a repentant heart and faith in Christ and the righteous work that he did for us so that we could be saved. Now, we're going to go on and talk about this some more because he's going to tell them how, what they need to do to be saved. And I love this because it, it is simple. Salvation, now again, Studying the Bible can be extremely deep. I've been a pastor for 30 years. I still feel like I'm two inches deep in the ocean when it comes to the depths of my understanding of God's word. Can we all say amen to that? So that being said, too often we think we've got to accumulate all this knowledge before we can be saved, and he's already told them it's near them. So point number three, salvation. God's righteousness is imputed to all who respond by his grace. It's simply faith and confession. Look what it says there in verse nine. It says there, it's near you. The word of faith is in your mouth, the word which we preach, word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be on the path. You'll have step one of 55 steps. What does it say? You will be what? Let me read that again. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That seems so simple. 
And sadly, most people will reject it. It's offered universally, accepted individually. God's righteousness imputed to all who respond by grace. And it's simple. Confess and believe. Not work, not strive to achieve, but confess and believe. Not do good works and hope you earn it. Try to be better than other people. God grades on a curve. Hope I'm in the top half. Hope I do enough good stuff to earn heaven. It's not work and strive to achieve, but confess and believe. Human responsibility comes with free will. Confession is agreeing with. The word to confess the Lord Jesus means we agree with who he said he is, that he's God. He's the Messiah. He's the only way to salvation. Lord Jesus in that verse means giving him the supreme place in your life. Guys, it's not praying a prayer and then walking out with a life that never changes. Because if you've truly confessed him as Lord, as Savior and Lord, again, not just Savior, but Lord. And Lord means he's the Lord of your life. He's on the throne of your life. He's in charge of your life. You surrender your life to him. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And then when we confess that and we surrender our lives to him, if our confession is real, everything is going to change. I used to say in Santa Cruz, we used to meet on on the Pacific Garden Mall. There's tons of homeless people. And I'd say, look, If we handed out bottles of Jack Daniels, we could get 500 people in here tonight to confess Jesus Christ as Lord. For a buck, is that sincere? Is that real? For them, Jack Daniels is Lord at this point. They need Jesus. But the point I'm making is, just because you pray a prayer and you walk an aisle and you confess these words, oh, it says if I do that, I'm going to heaven. Well, can it hurt? I'll try that. It's not this just saying something just in case. Well, in case Jesus really is God, I'll just say the word so I know that I'm covered on Judgment Day. No, true confession is going to produce a truly radically changed life. There's been no change. There's been no salvation. By your fruit, they shall know you. No fruit, no salvation. No conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life, no salvation. If you've been saved, the Holy Spirit will change you from the inside out. Believe in your heart, not just a mere intellectual agreement in the cross, but believe in your heart that results in confession with your mouth, transformation of your life. So here it is. You believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth, and there's transformation in your life. That's someone who's truly been saved. Verse 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The result in righteousness and salvation comes from belief and confession. Belief on him, again, that he is God, that he can save you, entering into intimate fellowship with him. While we are responsible to respond, there's not a hint of works in this equation. Not one hint of works in this equation. There's no way uh, that we can earn it or try harder to deserve it. He gives it to you freely. Here's the... There's so many analogies you can use. But imagine if we're all drowning. We're all drowning. He's throwing out life preservers. Who wants one? I'm good. I'll figure out a way myself. If you grab a hold of one, you done any good works? No. He's offered it to you. Guys, we need to respond by faith to what Christ has done for us. He says there, verse 11, For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who come upon him. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you you underline verses in your Bible, that should be underlined about ten times over. Whoever believes in him. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord. It doesn't say, and the elect will respond by, it doesn't say in the specially gifted, predestined ones. It says, whosoever, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God doesn't limit salvation to some. He offers it to all. It's up to us to respond or, or to reject the free gift of salvation. 
There's no distinction. Salvation is simple for, just as simple for a religious Jew as a pagan Gentile. God is no less eager to save a Gentile than he is to save a Jew. He's no less eager to save a very religious person than he is to save uh, uh, someone who is pagan and lost, someone who lives a wicked life. He desires that none should perish, no, not one. There's no read, way to read the balance of Scripture and say, well, God only chose a few people and his, and his salvation is only limited, his atonement's limited only for some, and, you know, and, I don't, and so only those people can be saved, and the rest of these people are damned to hell with no chance to be saved. That's a false doctrine as far as I'm concerned because the Bible doesn't teach that. Amen. Whosoever, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Does that sound like it's a limited number of people have an opportunity? Whoever calls. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, saved, the word saved there is delivered, rescued, one and able to save themselves. So the sovereignty of God, God has chosen, elected, predestined, all true. Responsibility of man, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They're both true. They're both true. God knows. So what's the source of truth? Look at verse 14. I think we've heard this verse quoted a few times during the announcements. <laughs> Amen? How then shall they call on him who they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? If people are to be saved, a preacher must be sent, a message must be preached, a message must be heard, a message must be believed. The ba this is the basis for missionary activity in the church. Having heard, we're called to share Jesus. The most selfish thing we can do is keep it to ourselves. I've shared this with you before. When I worked in San Jose in my office, a company I still work for now, I got called in one day because uh, the general manager said someone was complaining about some of the Christian stickers on my cubicle. They complained about the Bible study we had, and he said he was offended by some of the Christian stickers. The one that really bugged him, because he was a devout atheist, is that I had one that said, National Atheist Day, April 1st. <laughs> and the Bible verse underneath it was, the fool hath said in his heart there is no God. Amen? So she calls me into the office and says, Dave, you're going to have to take some of those stickers down. I go, her name was Terry. I said, Terry, the guy behind me has got a gay Johnny poster with a bunch of homosexual stuff on his cubicle. The guy in front of me has a, has a feng shui fountain and all this other. And then someone over there beside there has this. And I said, you got all these people with all their stuff. And I said, and the one guy you got in here is the guy that puts up the truth of the gospel. Well, Dave, I'm going to need to take it down. I said, well, let me say something to you. What if we all had cancer in the entire office, all four stories of our office, and what if I got it with you and then I was given an antidote? And I took the antidote and my cancer went away. And what if that doctor gave me enough antidote for everyone to be healed? What kind of person would I be to come back and take that antidote and stick it in my drawer and keep it to myself? She said, well, that would be horrible. I said, well, guess what? There's a cancer, it's called sin, it's infected all of us, and Jesus Christ is the antidote, and I'm not gonna put him in a drawer and keep it to myself. I'm just not gonna do it. And she just looked at me and said, well, I didn't think you would, so I just said, I have to write down. <laughs> I have to write down that I talked to you about it. But the point is that God's word is the source of truth. God's word is the answer. And how are they going to hear if we don't tell them? Amen? Amen? And how are there going to be people sent to tell them if we don't send them? And how, are they, how can we hold them accountable in a sense? How are they going to know? So guess what? We'll often say, well, those people over there never hurt. Well, guess what? You know what that does? That ought to encourage us to go tell them. Amen? Amen? To be obedient to the word. All need to hear. And God can speak to them any way he wants. He chooses to use a human messenger. It says there in the rest of verse 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Those who are active and moving and spreading the gospel, the Lord says, how beautiful are their feet. Now guys, we all have a mission field. I'm thankful for the group going to Uganda. God bless them. At the same time, you're going to a mission field when you leave here today. 
your neighborhood, your coworkers. When you walk out in the hall, we're in the mission field, amen? And we should go on missions trips, you know, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth, but I think more often than not that we don't take advantage of the mission field that's right in front of us. Notice what he says, unless they preach. What do they preach? They preach the gospel of grace, the gospel of peace, the good news of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We are to be sending those out to preach the gospel and we are to share it in our churches as well. Not to hide the good news in some culturally relevant pablum that doesn't offend anybody. Amen? Come to our church. We're doing seven steps to financial freedom. Take good care of your money. Ain't going to get you to heaven. Amen? Three ways to overcome the anger. Beaver doesn't live here anymore the series. The roller coaster ride of life. Uh, I, I saw one in, in the paper about they were doing a Star Wars series. <laughs> Preach Jesus Christ and crucified and risen from the dead. Amen. Amen? Glad tidings. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In midst of all the garbage in the world today, may we share the truth. Do people need to hear about God's love? Do they need to know about the grace of God? Do they need to know they, be, they can be forgiven? Do they need to know that they can go to heaven no, no matter how many vile, wicked things they've done? They're not beyond where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Guys, how can we keep that to ourselves? Lord, help us. Verse 16 and 17. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? Let's all read this verse together. You all ought to know it. Verse 17. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Amen and amen and amen. You want more faith? Read your Bible more. You want deeper faith? Read the book. Don't wait for the movie. Amen? Guys, you're as close to God as you want to be. And this is the roadmap to closeness with the Lord, to intimate fellowship with God, prayer and his word. Spend time on your knees and time in his word, and you will be as close to God as you want to be. Every one of us is as close to God as we want to be. Some of us are not close because we haven't acted like we want to be. Your Bible's collecting dust, and you're watching, you know, 57 hours a week of Netflix. The word of God will transform us. We're to desire the word of God more than our necessary food. You want your faith to grow? Read the Bible. John Corson is one of my favorite Bible teachers. I'll never forget his response. Someone said to him, Pastor John, wife got killed, daughter got killed, went through some very difficult things, and someone said, I want to have faith like you. And he said, you can read the Bible as much as I do. I wish I had more faith. Okay. Open up your Bible. And don't just open it, read it, and obey it. Amen? Open it, read it, and obey it. Finally, last three verses. God's sovereign foreknowledge of Israel's response. So we see that faith, true faith, saving faith, and sanctifying faith. I've already been saved, but you know what? I need to grow in my intimate relationship with the Lord. And then finally, we're going to see, in a sense, Israel's response to being given the word of God. Look what it says here. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. The sound has gone out to all the earth and, the words, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not of the nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. The word had gone out to the entire nation of Israel. It had been going out to the nation of Israel for th thousands of years. Exposure to the truth. Exposure to the word of God. Exposed to the power of God. They'd seen his miracles. They'd heard him speak. They had his word. They had the prophets. They had God's provision. They had God's faithfulness. And here's the problem. Most people say, well, if God would just show himself to me, then I would believe. And you know, with Lazarus and the rich man, the rich man's burning in hell after he dies. And he says to the Lord, go back and tell my family. And the Lord says, if they will not believe the word of God, 
They will not believe even if an angel shows up. To paraphrase. But that's what he's saying here is, guys, the word of God is what transforms our lives. But having heard the word, sadly, at this, up to this point, a vast majority of the children of Israel had rejected God's word, so it was delivered to the Gentiles. And it says that we will provoke the Jews to jealousy through our intimate fellowship with God. Living a life of intimate faith with God will provoke jealousy in others. People are going to want to know why you have peace when nobody else does. Everybody's angry and bitter. We live in a divided country right now. Can we say amen to that? People are angry and bitter. and you, ah, You're a red state. I'm blue state. I hate you. Why are you? There's this animosity and an anger and a bitterness and chasing after the things of the world. And then in the middle of that, we should be people of peace. Amen? We have the joy of the Lord. I'm going to heaven. Praise God. And in the middle of all that turmoil and finding no peace and getting all the money in the world and not being satisfied or life's falling apart and recognizing there's a need for hope. And guess what, guys? We should exhibit it every single day. Not that we're perfect, but that we have hope because we have Christ. And it should be evident to a lost and a dying world. They had heard, but they had not believed. You know who else is, who's, who's indicted just as much, if not more, than Israel? The United States of America. Have we heard the word of God? As much or more than any people who've ever lived? We got Christian radio stations, we got Christian commentaries, we got Christian internet, we got Christian, you, you have to trip over, you trip over Jesus if you're not looking for him in the United States. And yet most of our country still does not believe. Lord help. They're in rebellion all day, it says all day long he stretched out his hands, you know I love that it says his hands, because when he stretches out his hands, what kind of hands are they? They're pierced hands. He stretches out his nail-pierced hands all day long. And yet they did not believe. The Lord draws you by his Holy Spirit. He reaches out to you all day long. And yet, sadly, most will not believe. God's grace continues to reach out. Romans 11 is an amazing chapter because we're going to see that God has a future plan for the Jewish nation. He hasn't given up on them yet. And here's the good news. If you haven't given your life to the Lord yet, he hasn't given up on you yet either. Aren't you glad? You can give your life to the Lord even now. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you now as we go to this time of communion. Lord, we would do this in remembrance of you, in remembrance of the greatest act of love in all of human history. Lord, as we come and we take the elements and remember the cross of Calvary, Lord, I pray if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know you, that today would be the day of salvation. As your word says this morning, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. If you're here this morning, you've never done that. Maybe you've been going to church a long time. Maybe it's your first time going to church in a long time. Maybe you've been trusting in your heritage or trusting in church attendance but you've never fully surrendered your life to the Lord. Right now, I'm going to give you an opportunity to confess him before men. Say, so if you confess him with me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. And then you'll be able to take communion with us because communion is for believers. If you're here this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. And you, know, you recognize your need to surrender your life to him. Don't put your faith in religion. Don't put your faith in your good works. If you're ready to put your faith in Jesus Christ, I want you to just raise your hand right where you are and I'll pray with you. Anybody at all. Today's a day of salvation. Don't leave here without the Lord. He loves you so much. Anybody at all. Lord, we thank you for the promises of your word. And now we go to this time of communion. Lord, we're going to do this in remembrance of you. The greatest act of love in all of human history. Lord, may we do this with a sincere heart. As an act of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.